what's up? Welcome back to Running Things. My name's Riley. I'm your host. I'm also the editor over at tempojournal.com. You're sick of me saying this, right? But it is another crazy good episode of Running Things today. We have Jess Hull, the national record holder in the 1500, the 3K and the 5K. She is a professional runner for Nike. She trains over in Portland, Oregon. She is right now sitting in a hotel room in Sydney doing her time, doing her 14 days of quarantine. She has all the time in the world, which means we took advantage of it, grabbed her for the show. Sit back, enjoy this one. Jess Hull. All right, super exciting guest on the show today. She's just back fresh into Australia. Surprised they let her back in with all that baggage, all those national records in her suitcase. <laughs> I am talking to live from quarantine in Sydney, Jess Hull. Jess, how are you? I'm great, thank you. Thanks for having me on. It's good to be back on Australian soil. Hey, let's um before we jump into an amazing year and, and all those records, I'm I'm super curious. I think you're the first person I've spoken to about like who's who's actually in quarantine. Um <laughs> what's it what's it like? Talk me through it. You've been there for a week. How how's it been? Yeah, it's been okay so far. I'm on day six. So that's kind of nice. I kind of think once I get over day seven and I'm on the home stretch, it's going to be a lot better. Just like a workout. Once you get over halfway, you're on the <laughs> home stretch. Um, yeah. So it's actually, it's surprisingly gone kind of fast. Like the days go quick. Um, but you do notice like every hour, like every hour is like a milestone. Um, but considering the day, like considering that, uh, the days are rolling by pretty quickly. So hopefully the second half is just as good. <laughs> Is it, um, I know you kind of said a couple of days ago on Instagram that it was, you know, this, like it's the first time you've really stopped for a while and had a chance to reflect yeah. on the season. Um, what, what else have you been up to? Is it Netflix? Are you reading books? Are you planning out your summer? Like how are you sort of feeling those days? Yeah. So right now I've been finding ways to keep busy. I haven't really taken too much time to just like veg out and watch Netflix yet. Um, I think the key from people that I'd seen having done quarantine before, I think the key was that you needed to find ways to fill your days. So yeah, I've just been catching up on some emails and doing all those things that maybe I don't quite keep on top of as consistently in the season when I'm focused on training. Um, but in a way, it's kind of nice to be settled. I know I'm not at home yet, but um, it's probably the longest time I've been settled in one place since I left for Europe. So in a way, it was kind of nice to know that for, okay, for 14 days, I don't have to, to change locations. Um, you know, so I guess, yeah, you just got to put a positive spin on it and, um, find ways to fill your day. I write myself a little schedule each day just to try and, uh, make sure I'm not losing track of time. So yeah, it's just been little things like that and talking to talking to you guys and doing a few podcasts with some high school athletes and yeah, just finding ways to, to fill the hours. Now I'm, um, my, my life or my days pretty much revolve around my meal times, right? <laughs> like when I'm eating breakfast, I'm thinking about, okay, what's for lunch today and, and so on and so forth. Um, what's the, what's the food situation like? Do they really just like drop a bag of food every few hours at your door? And like, can you request things? Like what's the, how does that work? Yeah. So I'm at the Novotel on Darling Harbour and they have been awesome with, um, the meals. I think they're kind of outsourcing them to some close by restaurants because we kind of get a bit of um, a lot of Thai food, lots of curries kind of thing, but they're all super fresh. So same day, I'm guessing, <laughs> I'm hoping anyway. Um, <laughs> Thai food and Indian food is heavily on the rotation. Um, they did a Sunday roast, roast lamb, which is about as Australian as you can get to get a Sunday roast. I mean, I'd probably get that if I was at home right now anyway. So not as good as mum's, but uh, still kind of nice to have that familiarity. But yeah, they, they do just drop the bag at the door and knock. Um, it's kind of, it's a bit uh, when you're sitting in silence and you're just kind of going about your day. Um, well, I even have the TV on or a podcast, but it's still a bit of a shock to get a knock at the door because you know, like no one can come in. So <laughs> it's kind of uh, meal times is still kind of be a bit surprising when they roll around just to hear that knock on the door. But uh, breakfast is, it all comes like as when it says it's going to come, they say 7 a.m., midday and 6 p.m. So, yeah, meal times are pretty standard. But uh, it's not the, I wouldn't say it's the highlight of the day, but it is kind of uh, interesting to see what you're going to get. <laughs> when you don't know what you're having, um, it's kind of nice to open it up and see what the surprise is. Yeah, that keeps it fun. Um, what <laughs> yeah. about like 
last last question. I'm just super fascinated by this, but um, <laughs> how much like do you get any fresh air? Do you, like how much fresh air do you get? Do you yeah? What's how does that work? Yeah. So where I am, there's no outside time at all, uh, and the, I have a big window um, right in front of me with a view of an apartment complex across the road. But uh, my window doesn't open. Um, I think that's the case for most people doing quarantine in New South Wales, at least. Um, Brisbane and Perth may have some people have balconies, but I think that's more families who need a bigger apartment situation than a hotel room. Um, and then I think Lydia is over in New Zealand and they get to run outside a little bit. But for me here, it's um, entirely confined to my room and no fresh air for another eight days. So, which it's not, it's not too bad. I've just made sure I kept the air conditioner on and I think it's, it's not fresh, but it's at least keeping cycled air coming through. So it's as best as I can do. That fresh air, when, when that fresh air hits in eight days, that's going to feel amazing. <laughs> I know. I hope so. I think uh, you'll never take for granted being able to walk outside again. Totally. Um, let's let's talk about reflecting on 2020. Um, obviously, you know, March, April this year, um, when it became apparent that the Olympics would be postponed and the kind of the season would be thrown into disarray. You know, we didn't really know what was going to be in store for us, but now you you sit here at the end of the season with three brand new national records. Like, you know, how, how, how do you reflect on 2020? How do you grade it? Yeah, I think uh, I would grade it. I'd probably give it a B plus because it was pretty good. It was pretty solid, but there's a lot that I can still improve on. Like, I think I don't want to be, I think it's actually funny you say, can I grade it? Because back in January, my first workout with the team in Phoenix, um, cause I joined them again after Christmas, uh, Pete did the same thing. He kind of like graded our workouts and it was a bit of a joke on that day. And, uh, he gave me an A for the day. And I think Donovan was like, Oh, like you've done great. Like you got an A for the first workout. And I was like, no, 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 we, d- we don't want to be at an A on January 2nd. Like that's, uh, <laughs> we're going to have somewhere to go. Um, so I think that's probably why I'd say it's a B plus cause it was strong. It was better than average but there's there's room to go at 23 I don't want to be having an A plus season just yet <laughs> yeah I think uh it's it's a good outlook because you are you, you're so close to the start you're closer to the start of your career than even the middle of your career at this point so there's still so much yeah promise and I think that's that's why kind of people are so excited by you know people people here in Australia are so excited by your season because to be to be breaking you know, these national records that stood for quite a while, a lot of them, um, at such a young age is, is just so promising. How does, yeah. how does those, how do those end of season chats with Pete look like what's, what's sort of his feedback on your year? Uh, so, so far it's been kind of like, we're looking at the fact that I'm young and I've got a lot of things I can work on and kind of when I give him a bit of feedback coming off races and thinking like what else I need to be doing to to be able to run not just four flat and being in the second, third, fourth position, but being like able to run with women like Laura Muir and run 357 and gun from the front like she does. Uh, he kind of just reminds me, is like, yep, we're young, we have a lot to work on and there's a lot we can improve, um, but we're just going to do it one piece at a time and we're going to do it so that I don't get injured and that we can keep some consistency season to season. And I think uh, that's kind of been the thing is like we've acknowledged that it's been a good year but we acknowledge there's a long way to go so yeah keeps me keeps me looking forward is it is it hard to um manage your own expectations and the expectations of people around you because it's so easy to forget and you and I were just chatting off air like um I came down to Eugene Oregon in Mm -hmm. I'm gonna say March or April last year when you were still you were still at college um yeah you know, and it feels like the transition for you from from college athlete college athlete to the pros has been like super smooth. It's just gone perfectly, right? But it, that's not to say that 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 your running career will always be like this. You know, so expectations is, is is kind of a funny thing. How do you stay grounded when you are performing so well? Yeah, I think um, personally, it's because of the people that I'm around. Is that like I have a higher level of expectation on myself because I'm surrounded by 
so much talent. Um, I look at like my progress, my progress against myself is great this year. Um, and I'm really happy with it. But then I look at my teammates and I have Constanzi and Shannon who have run 358, 356, 1420s, 1430s. And it's like, you can't get complacent at all when the people around you are of that level. Like, um, it's good to run four flat and it's good to run 1440s. But even just compared to the people that I train with every day, I still have a long way to go. And I think, um, like, I appreciate the progress I've made forwards, but I, I know that there's a long way to go to be competitive and to have results that they've had on the world stage. And um, even people like, I was talking to Genevieve in Doha and it's like, it's great to have run Aussie records this year, but she's a two-time Olympian and I'm not even that yet. So there's a lot to, a lot left to accomplish and that's definitely going to fuel, I hope, the next lot of years to come. We, we've spoken to um, Donovan recently on the show. Uh, we've spoken to Craig as well. And both of yeah. those guys <laughs> speaking about, speaking about Pete, you know, it's very clear yeah. that for them, running is not about running times or running standards or they're not worried about the clock. It, you know, Pete is teaching them yeah. to be racers and to, you know, from whatever position they find themselves in on the track to be able to win or to influence a race. Is that, you know, mm -hmm. and as great as it is to have national records, um, is that sort of something that Pete's doing with you as well? It's more about being a good racer than it is running fast times? Oh, yeah, definitely. Even um, even when I have run fast this season, uh, we haven't necessarily ran to run a time. Like in Monaco, the instruction was to run as hard as I could until I couldn't. And then in Berlin, he just told me to go for it and put myself in it. And if you look at it, like even if you look at the Berlin race, like Shannon and I were in similar fitness. But for us to have our best races, we had to approach it two different ways. Um, so in terms of us to be successful and finish as high as possible, the race plan is always directed at that, knowing that if we can execute the race plan um, and the race goes, because uh, often that's not always the case or other, um, if the race goes and you execute your race plan, you're going to be pretty happy with what you see on the clock at the end of the day. But um, we, even this year, when we had the opportunity really to focus on running fast, we never talked about like intermediate splits or anything um, other than being kind of prepared for what the pacemakers were going to do, um, we never said like at this point you need to be hitting 800 meters in 208 or anything. We just kind of focused on racing the race that was in front of us and learning because in a championship, that's what you have to do. You mentioned Shannon and I, I want to ask a question about, I guess, the team dynamic, you know, you're all, well, a lot of you guys are still so young. Like, you know, we just spoke about your yeah. only what, a year, year and a half into being a professional athlete. Donovan, yeah. Craig, these guys are super young as well. You know, Raven, who's just joined the squad. Um, yeah. But then you're so lucky that you've got someone like Shannon who has the experience and, you know, you, you're sort of right there on her hip throughout both training and races from yeah. what we see. Um, how much are you sort of leaning on her for sort of experience and asking questions and trying to sort of soak up what she has to offer? Oh, big time. Um, this is, I had had a couple of weeks with her in early January, February when she'd come out to Phoenix for um, some training and stuff and got to know her pretty well. And then this summer was the first time we've kind of traveled and trained and competed together. And just like how willing to share her knowledge and her experience she is with me has been huge. Like, I feel like um, every time she says something, I feel like I need to write it down. <laughs> I can take it forward <laughs> with me. So, um, and it's just incredible to that, how open she is with me. Like she wants to share what she's done in the past with me and um, make sure that like I'm prepared going into races and even talking about races beforehand. Like we talk very openly about what we think other people are going to do. Um, we know what each other is going to do and it's all designed for us to maximize our own race plan not never kind of like um it always works in a forward momentum kind of thing for us to to share what we're going to do on the track and um go out there and it's kind of it's definitely a comforting factor um I would say in Monaco for sure when I was like totally in uncharted territory um to kind of know that she's right here um and then even Pete kind of told me from the sideline with about a mile to go because Shannon had done a lot of work for our duo and um, Beatrice Chepkovic was sitting on us too. Um, Pete asked me to take a lap or two and I was like, well, if 
if it wasn't Shannon, I wouldn't have taken that risk. But um, when your training partner's out there and you know how much work that they put into everything as much as you do and you want to see them successful, uh, it definitely is a way to to rejig the focus. And um, it definitely helped me be able to put together the last 1200 to a K um, in Monaco. And yeah, I think being able to lean into each other uh, has been a huge strength for, I hope, both of us, but definitely um, on my side of things. Yeah, she's uh, she's got to enjoy the push as well from someone like yourself, I'm sure. Um, yeah. <laughs> how have you found she's speedy, the... though. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. How have you found that? <laughs> she's got the... me in a few workouts. <laughs> oh, really? How, well, how's, yeah, how's but... that? Like, you know, going from being at Oregon, you were, you know, you're sort of like big fish in a small pond at Oregon, right? And then you come up to the pros yeah. and all of a sudden, you know, workouts are not like that anymore. You know, you're not always yeah. on the front, you know, doing like leading all the reps. How has that kind of change been? Has that been good for you? Is it like less pressure, less expectation? Oh, yeah, I love it. I think um, I just look at it as like if these women are so experienced and if I can hang on until I can't um, and even like in 200 repeats, like Shannon is so much stronger and it's just the years and years and years of work then um that are on top of each other and I just kind of look at it as like well if I can be this good in 12 years time like I'm gonna be pretty happy so for right now I just keep perspective as to where I am but um yeah it's definitely a it's a good challenge to know that when I turn up to training every day like these women are gonna are gonna bring it and um I can try and hang on and be as close as I can What's the what's the lifestyle adjustment been like for you? Because as I say, I came down to yeah. Eugene, which, I mean, it's a nice place, right? But it's yeah. uh, you know, it's <laughs> it's a it's a massive change for you now to be you know you've been in this team environment where you're always surrounded by a pretty decent sized team and and obviously amazing facilities down at Oregon. Um, but there's there's always someone to do your sessions with or your recovery jog or whatever. To now living the life of a professional where everything's a little bit more serious and you know when everyone comes to training this is these are people's careers and their livelihoods and it's it all kind of matters yeah. a little bit more as a professional how yeah. how have you adjusted to that because again it like from the outside looking in it looks like it's just been like seamless take it in your stride you know really easy to sort of deal with yeah i think that this year's been a weird year to kind of make an adjustment I guess in a way um I think last summer I was still riding the high of like I was joining the group everything was new we were going to altitude we were going to Doha I was going to come back to Australia um take my break and then join the team again in January um and all of that went super smoothly and I think that was um a long time coming of like it was just all so exciting to have new teammates and to have people and be in this environment and working towards being at the Olympics. Um, and I'm really lucky with the group that we have, like we keep it super fun. I don't think none of us are super like intense people. I think we do a good job keeping a good balance in what we're doing. Even when we go to these diamond league meets and, um, big championships, like we don't get too internal or too in our own heads or anything. We're very good at keeping things light and fresh and trying to have fun as much as we can. So I hope that that's, uh, that's definitely helped my transition. And I think that that's something that isn't going to change with the people that I'm around. So I hope that that continues going forward to, to make things pretty seamless, but I, it's inevitable that sometimes it's not always going to be as simple as this, but um, given this year was so, so strange, I was able to spend quite a lot of time at home um, and just being able to kind of have a uh, company from my dad and my boyfriend in practice and stuff like they, I never did anything solo. Um, so that was pretty, pretty like incredible to be able to manage not having to do anything on my own, even for all of the, the lockdowns and stuff. Um, I always had one person with me. Um, and that's something that our team is pretty good at is like Pete finds ways to, when we're all in one place, we find ways to run in pairs and whether that means that two women are doing similar workouts or someone can jump in behind the guys, um, we do a way, uh, we do a good job of trying to keep it a team atmosphere and whether that's our teammates and our coach and our strength and conditioning coach or um, making a team around us wherever we are in the world. Um, it's been a, a good way to help transition. Jess, we, we spoke with Craig last week and I, I sort of asked him, I was like, <laughs> you know, 
for our Australian audience, you know, you're on the same team as Jess Hull, traveled to Monaco together. And, you know, what's, what's it like being on the same team as Jess? And he was like, he was like, man, sometimes she's just, she's the most positive person I've ever met. Sometimes she's too positive. <laughs> and he's like, you know, he's like, at times it's like, damn it, Jess, just get angry at something or just, you know, like, <laughs> um, talk to me about the team dynamic, because like, we look at things like Monaco, where you guys obviously raced and then got to kind of, you know, spend a couple of days together afterwards. What's it, yeah. what's it been like being, being part of that team? It must be a lot of fun. Oh, it's super fun. And I think um, that is most like that comes from being around great people, but it comes from also Pete kind of reminding us, he's like, it's pretty cool that we get to travel the world and do this. And um, like that, we got to go over to Europe this season and make a season happen um, when majority of the world couldn't do that. So I think uh, being able to be around those guys and um, even Craig asked me at one point in time while we were overseas, he was like, what would... Australia described me as in terms of like uh like slang like lingo kind of thing and I was like I think you'd be like a good Aussie larrikin like do you think that's right like he would be referred to as kind of like a larrikin yeah I think that's <laughs> so, spot on. yeah yeah so I think it's good that um we have such a mix of uh we come from different backgrounds we have um Raven was a duck with me too, so we have that in common. And I think um, Eric as well. So, and we're pretty proud ducks. Like you'll you'll catch us kind of going back to our time at Oregon as much as we can, live in the glory days. And um, then you have Shannon who brings in her family. Like we had her husband and uh, her daughter were with me in Berlin for uh, nearly two and a half weeks, and that was super fun to kind of have like the family feel on the road too. Like we have a great family feel amongst our teammates, but to have um, kind of that element as well was pretty cool. And I, it was like something you kind of don't get when you're just um, traveling like last season when it was just like the young guns kind of getting fitted altitude up in St. Moritz. Um, it was cool to have that dynamic of we've got a little kid on the road with us and um, she was super, she's a great child, like she's easygoing. So that was really easy to have. And um, yeah, then you have Donovan who goes fishing in the middle of Stockholm. So yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I think that kind of displays the array that we've got on the team at the moment. Just um, it's never ending fun in all different ways. I, I want to ask, and, and you, you've, I'm sure you've covered this somewhere, but um, I certainly haven't spoken to you about it. You know, like if we rewind to, you know, um, early to middle part of 2019, you you were obviously such a highly regarded athlete coming out of Oregon. You you realistically could have signed with anybody anywhere in the world. Mm -hmm. You chose you chose Pete's group, um, Julian's joggers or Pete Elite, as Craig's calling them. <laughs> uh, yeah, Pete's Elite. <laughs> what, what were you know? What were the main sort of factors? Obviously, staying in staying in Oregon was seems like it was a big one for you. But what were the main factors that went into that decision? Yeah, I think uh, at the time, the biggest thing for me was I wanted to go somewhere where I was going to get dropped and get my butt kicked in training every day. Um, that was the way forward that I saw was to be better. You have to be around people that are better than you in a lot of ways. And um, definitely Coco being so successful um, and running so incredibly well. Uh, that was a big draw card for me was I... I wanted to train with her. I was like, well, if I want to be doing what she's doing and um, as successful as she has been, then I want to train with you and um, I want to I want to see what it takes. And yeah, she has an incredible work ethic. And just once I kind of got the feel for the team, I, I was very much happy to to be based in Portland and stay stay close to Eugene. And um, if I ever want to dip back down there, I probably can when I'm in the US. But uh yeah, that was the biggest draw card for me was just to be around people that were were better than me and try and push me further than I thought I could go. Yeah. You're obviously you're back in Oz now. Um and I guess if you're going through this whole two week quarantine thing, I'm guessing you're planning to be here yeah. for a little while at least. Um what is what does summer look like for you, both from a running perspective and a and a life perspective? What's uh what have you got planned for the rest of twenty twenty and beyond? Yeah, for the rest of 2020 right now, um, focus is on getting my US visa. Uh, so to do that, uh, I've been trying to do it all year, but with the consulates just being uh, 
they keep closing and um, they're only seeing very few people right now. So that's kind of the thought process behind coming back to Australia was after my season, I could either leave the Shenzhen for the number of days necessary to go back into the U.S., but I would be on a time limit in the U.S. and inevitably have to quarantine once I got back to Australia. So we prioritized the visa and just came home right now. And that way, once things are operating, I'm right where I need to be and I can hopefully join my team in January, even sooner maybe. Um, plan is to go to altitude in January. So right now, I'll just get to enjoy some extra family time and uh, I've spent the majority of the year in Australia this year, which hasn't happened for a long time. So so that's really nice. Um, I'll do my full build up here and then once I leave, it'll just be, I'll probably leave until there's no hotel quarantines in place. So um, I'll certainly make the most of being around my family and my fiance uh, for the next couple of months. Yeah. Let's, um, let's fast forward into 2021. Do you, you're obviously, you've, you've punched your ticket to Tokyo for the 5,000 meters already. Um, do you have a yes. preference between the 15 or the five? Ooh. I don't know if I have a preference. Uh, I'm not because sure. Because the schedule, I, I both, the schedule yeah. in Tokyo is is no good. Obviously, um, I think. No. I think the fifteen hundred <laughs> heats are on the same are on the in the morning, and then the five thousand final is in the evening or something like that. Yeah, yeah. The fifteen five double isn't possible. Um, well, at least not for me. Maybe for someone of Stefan Hassan or Shelby Houlihan, maybe they'll rate their chances, but. Uh, not possible for me at this point in time. Um, yeah, so I'm not sure. I love I love them both. Um, I think the first time I ran a really hard 5K was this summer and it was brutal. I've never been in that much pain before. Um, and the thought of maybe having to do that twice in 72 hours is a little bit scary. Um, but I trust that whatever we are leaning towards, Pete will have me ready to go for it. So if it does mean we choose the 5K and I do have to run 14, 45 in a prelim because that's just the world we're in right now with distance running. Um, if I have to run a, fir- a first round pretty fast or pretty much PR to make the final and then PR again three days later, I think um, Pete will have me ready to do so. But the 1500 is just more of my safety net. Like I know how to run 1500s, but both events on the world stage right now are just like at a whole nother level. Like if you look at what it took to medal in Doha and then we see a world record fall in the 5K, run 1406 this week. And it's like, well, I was getting closer and then we've gone (laughs) to a whole nother level. (laughs) So yeah, I think right now um, I'll be happy with, doing either in Tokyo and Pete will make the best decision based at where I'm at for, for my age and my training age and everything. And then going forward, we'll be able to hopefully do a bit of both. And uh, especially in Eugene in 2022, I'd love to be able to double on my home track. So yeah, a double is not possible next year, but I'm sure in the future, I won't have to make this decision. How much, you, you know, you speak about this crazy world that, um, the distance running is in right now like <laughs> how much attention are you paying to that through the year because you know we saw yeah. throughout the middle of the year while you know a lot of Pete's group were racing things like the big friendly and getting ready for diamond league mm-hmm. you know the Bowman athletes like Shelby and Carissa who you've you've raced a number of times in college like they yeah. were setting you know they were all setting yeah. PRs you know on, in the 15 and the 5 and whatever and then obviously the events from last week like yeah, so how much attention do you pay to times that other people are kind of running around the world and think, oh, man, it's just getting quicker and quicker? <laughs> I love it. I love track. So I could watch it all day, and I really respect and appreciate people's performances. And um, I think I was able to follow along with what the the Bauman Group and our big friendlies were doing in the U.S., um, and it was so welcomed because I just wanted to see track like it had been so long since we'd been able to see meets go ahead and um, being able to watch those. And I think uh, it's pretty cool kind of personally, like I kind of see what others are doing and think, okay, maybe I can do that too. Like if, if you can see it, maybe you can be it down the track. And um, being able to kind of watch Carissa run in the 1420s this year was insane at the time because like I – had only run 15 flat and I was at home just training away hoping that we were going to get to Monaco and I was going to be able to have a crack at going under 15 um but then kind of after Monaco now it's like a different perspective it's like Carissa ran 
in the 1440s last year in the final in Doha and then she ran in the 1420s this year and I'm a year behind her out of college you know if you keep track of those kinds of things and I'm like well maybe maybe in 12 months time that's where I can be or if not 12 months time in in two years or three years like it's possible progression um and then yeah just watching the 1406 from Latessa and Bet earlier this week I think uh I don't think it's long before we see a woman break 14 minutes. That was my biggest takeaway from watching that because she just made it look so incredibly easy and smooth. And um, at the same time, you could see with 800 to go, she had given it everything she could have. And it was a case of she just wanted to get to the finish line now. Um, but yeah, I think that's just what we have to be ready for in sport like sport. We want to see things go to a new level. It keeps things exciting. And um, yeah, I think maybe... Even though it's not possible right now, I texted Pete after watching Gide run 14.06 and I was like, said the same thing. It's not long till we see a sub 14. And then he just sent me back like, why not you? And like, it seems incredibly crazy to think like 67s for 5K. Yep, that's so, so fast. But to know that like he doesn't have any limit on myself, maybe I shouldn't either. Um, Taking the sport to a new level as, as a whole, maybe will elevate what I could do in the length of my career. So I see it as a positive thing and I like seeing other people succeed because, I mean, it gives you the motivation to go out there and do it too. Totally. Um, <laughs> do you, when we, like, when we look ahead to 2021 and you mentioned that you want to be in, at altitude in January and, and you know, then we've yeah. got a whole 2021 season, do you, and, and knowing how positive you are and, and what Craig was saying about your positivity, <laughs> Do you do you spend any time at all worrying about like what 2021 looks like, whether it's like no crowds, whether it's meets postponed or cancelled again? Like, is that something you think about or you just control what you can sort of worry about? Yeah, definitely just control what I can control. But you can't like none of us could say that it hasn't crossed our mind that 2021 is going to look very different or like maybe not look like anything at all. Um but really, until we get there, we don't know. And we, like, our sport made this year happen. Um, there was a season that went ahead overseas, and it was it was different. But in terms of the racing opportunities, there was they were out there, and there was exactly what we needed for being able to keep the ball rolling into a second Olympic year, I guess, in a way. Um, so I'm pretty optimistic after sort of seeing what went ahead overseas this year and even from when I was overseas in itself um being in Europe like it was almost too normal like life was yeah there was all these COVID precautions at the meets we were in and stuff like that and there was testing and everything to make sure that everyone was able to compete and be around each other but in the general way of life was pretty normal so I think having seen that firsthand myself I'm pretty optimistic that next year is hopefully going to look like what we think it will and um if it I mean no crowd that would be pretty hard but um at the same time we had no crowd at a few of these meets in Europe and they were able to create some atmosphere and I think uh as long as if we can be out there and competing I think there's a lot of athletes that would still be very much happy the Olympics going ahead even if they they don't look like what they have in previous years Hmm. hey um I have a question that's like this is purely for my own curiosity here uh, yeah. And mainly because I've been um, having debates with friends about it. What's your <laughs> What's your take on the on the I think it's called wave light, the little the little blue and green lights on the track. Yeah, that we're starting to see recently. What's your take on it? Because I've got some people who are saying like, "Oh, this is yeah. such an advantage; it's crazy." And then like, there's another school of thought that says like, you know, athletes are used to pacing certain times or used to like. Mm-hmm getting their splits pretty accurate off the clock or off paces. Like, yeah. what? how do you see it? Oh, I don't know. I haven't really thought about it in terms of, like, uh, for if it's, like, useful for records and stuff. I think it's pretty incredible technology. And I know they had them on in Monaco. Uh, so they were set for the lead group. And then there was a, a light set set at maybe 70s as well. And as an athlete, I didn't even notice it because it's like right there and you don't look down like your posture is you're looking forward. So I'm not sure how much like uh, like the world records last week, I'm not sure how much they actually used the technology 
to run that fast. Um, <laughs> but at the same time, like, I think it's great. Like, you know how effective it is when you have a pacemaker, whether it's a workout or a, a race, like it makes it a big difference. And if it means that you can just see your full potential, then I think it's probably a good thing. Yeah, for sure. Um, <clears throat> and it's cool for, spe- it's cool for spectators as well. Like, I think it's good for us. Yeah. Um, yeah. My whole vibe on it was like, I'm just not sure when you're, you know, if you're Gide or your Chepsa guy in those efforts last week, like yeah. how much are you actually looking down at your foot to try and see, yeah. you know, but anyway, yeah. anyway. Cause noise runners aren't looking down. So I don't, I don't know too much about that, but, um, personally, I don't think you would be, be straight down at the track trying to see the lights. <laughs> yeah. Um, Hey, so, you know, you're going to be maybe here until Christmas-ish, sort of December, maybe Jan. What's, um, what's, what's your downtime looking like now? It, like, I, we haven't spoken to you since you got engaged either, so congrats on that. That feels like, <laughs> Thank you. I don't know, that feels like years ago, but it was, it was only a few yeah, months ago. I think. Um, <laughs> what's, yeah. what's your downtime looking like for the rest of this year? Yeah, so I am on my break right now for my hotel quarantine. Um, so good timing to just get that out of the way. Um, and then, yeah, once I get out of quarantine, I get out on the 21st and my birthday is the 22nd. So time that pretty well too. <laughs> nice. Um, but yeah, hopefully, hopefully we'll see a little bit of lifting in New South Wales that maybe will allow us to have a bit, um, more of a gathering to kind of celebrate getting engaged. Cause we, we haven't done that. Cause right now it's still capped at 10 people. Um, so we can't even have both our families in one place. So hopefully we'll be able to celebrate those little things. And then hopefully Christmas will be able to have a, a normal festive season with the the events that go on in December. And hopefully just, yeah, being able to be around more than your, just, just your household and celebrate the season that was my birthday and um, getting engaged with more than just the four people that we live with. <laughs> 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 wow what a uh it's crazy isn't it like all these like little things that we just yeah. take for granted that we can't do I know even um because I wasn't sure I hadn't really been keeping up with how New South Wales is progressing once I was overseas so I um was looking the other day thinking of like oh maybe while I'm in quarantine I can plan an engagement party <laughs> but um I was like I need to figure out the rules right now and it's still 10 people so that put that to a halt <laughs> Jess, you mentioned uh, earlier that, you know, you ran into obviously um, Jen Gregson in, in Doha and, yeah. you know, you've been, you've been at the same meets as, you know, Stewie and Rambo and, and all these guys mm-hmm. throughout the year. Um, yeah. It must be nice when you're, you know, everyone's on their own schedules and living their own sort of professional dreams. It must be nice to occasionally at least bump into some Aussies around the world. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And um, it's the same as like what I was saying with Raven and Eric and I being kind of proud ducks. Like we're proud Aussies too. Like uh, it's nice to sort of hear the accent wherever you are in the world. And um, it's been great to, we joked, we're like, we don't see each other that much when we're in Australia, but when we're on the circuit, we'll we'll cross paths quite a few times. So it's been super nice to see those guys. And um, even like Ryan has been really forthcoming with like advice and stuff like that too. So um he he noted that right now my I am going out very hard in races and I'm not always holding on but um so it's cool to kind of hear his perspective on those kinds of things and um in in all in a super positive like feedback kind of good criticism way and um then to sort of see what Stewie's been doing too it's just huge momentum like in Doha you broke the Australian record in the 15 and I'm warming up for the 3k thinking oh gosh Okay, pressure's on. You gotta go. You gotta go do it now too. <laughs> so yeah, it's really cool. It's just like um, we're not teammates uh, in terms of our training environment, but it's the same sort of momentum swing as what you get from the people you train with every day. Is when you want to look for swings in momentum too. You can see what the other Aussies are doing, and uh, it's been pretty cool to have have them out there too, making a go it's, of it um, in a in a weird year. It's um. It certainly feels like a really exciting time for Australian athletics. Like if we look on the distance side yeah. of things, especially the women's marathoning group we have right now is just mm-hmm. is just stacked. Um, and then we look at, yeah, we look at yeah. what Stewie's been able to do from the 10K all the way down to the 1500. We see what you're doing. Um, do you feel when you're, when you're racing overseas and when you're not in Australia, do you feel how much support you get 
from back home because it feels like you're the name that everybody keeps talking about here in Australia? (laughs) I don't think I've been in Australia long enough lately to kind of like know quite that that is the case. But um, I do feel so much support. Like I have, um, like Facebook is incredibly, it just blows up crazy. (laughs) (laughs) And that's because mum does a really good job of kind of keeping everyone that she knows up to date with what I'm doing. So yeah, the uh, it's pretty cool to kind of see how much support is coming through online and stuff and um, try not to get too caught up in it before a race, but afterwards to sort of see how much people are like really getting behind your performances and people are getting up to watch us at like the middle of the night and early in the morning. And that's pretty cool. Like um, to know that people care that much to, to get up in all hours of the morning just to watch the Diamond League, which is, um, I mean, I will admit I used to do it when I was a younger kid and um, Ryan was out there running. Like I would always be awake to watch him race and uh, stuff like that. So I hope that uh, it's kind of the people that are waking up early in the morning to watch us. um, It's been worthwhile. (laughs) Absolutely. Um, Last question. We're going to just go back to food for a second. Um, Yep. (laughs) normally like to ask people what their favorite sort of off-season snack food is for you stuck in a hotel that the next time there's a (laughs) knock on your door if it could be any food from anywhere what what would you be going with right now oh right now if I could I would probably say Thai of some kind um chicken pad Thai or a really good curry um yeah which I think more uh I like Thai food itself but it's also like a it's kind of usually a social meal. Like if you go out to Thai, you usually do like a banquet style, right? So you would order with your family, you would have four or five different dishes that just get passed around. So maybe I'm craving the social interaction that comes with Thai food as much as um, the actual meal itself. (laughs) So you could, you could sit in your hotel, eat it, think about like you would normally be in a social and then that would just kind of make you a bit sad maybe. (laughs) Yeah, maybe. (laughs) might have to get FaceTime going at the same time. <laughs> yeah. Hey, Jess, um, it's been amazing to catch up with you. As I say, like, I think that like, I saw you obviously back at the National 5K. Melbourne Track Classic? Yeah. Yeah, was that February or something? Um, you yes. know, and back then we were dealing with air quality from like the smoke haze. Remember that night? Like it was yeah, real kind of yeah. smoky and weird. Um, that Yeah, that feels like years ago Um, ago. (laughs) but it's like it's been amazing watching like the the growth and the progression of you this year and thanks for taking the time and um yeah we'd love to speak to you again someday yeah thank you absolutely anytime that was great jess is uh is an amazing athlete and like her positivity and her enthusiasm is uh is just infectious i first met jess yeah I, you heard me talk about it on the show it would have been i'm gonna say march 2019 i was in portland drove a couple of hours down to eugene when jess was still at the university of oregon um and just hung out did an interview uh took some shots of her and a couple of her uh teammates and we took we just took us on like a tour of uh the oregon athletic facility and it was amazing like the better than sort of any professional sports team you would see in Australia or, or probably even the AIS, like incredible. Anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed that chat with Jess. Make sure you're following her on social. We will also throw some links in the show notes to some of her races from this year as well, which you might want to check out. We don't get to see national records every day. That's it for today, guys. Thank you so much for checking out Running Things. If you are listening on the pod, make sure to subscribe. If you are watching on YouTube, you can subscribe to our YouTube channel as well. Thank you so much. See you next time and uh, take your easy days easy. Thanks so much for watching Running Things here on YouTube. If you haven't already, do us a favor, hit that little subscribe button. It really helps out our channel. Also, tell your friends and don't forget to follow us on Instagram at Tempo Journal.